um, this is the first uh, color film of the Institute of the Research in 23, inaugurating the, the year. We have, uh, I guess, from Jagiellonian uh, University in Krakow, in Poland. For those that are not familiar, Jagiellonian University is one of the oldest universities in the world. Yeah, as you know, one of the few on the Molikowski is a long tradition in physics in that institute. And um, Professor Komal Yannick graduated there in '95 with a double master, one in physics, particle physics, something that I heard for the first time today. Formula, I don't know that particle. <laughs> And then uh, he worked, he also in 96 gets his master in mathematics, uh, working on minimal surfaces. We shall learn what minimal surfaces are. And, and uh, in 97, in 96, 97, in the same university, in the University in Krakow, uh, he under the direction of Professor Marcel Novak. Which um, we have, um, you have known also years ago, and he visited. He graduated in physics, working on random matrix theory and application. But he continued working on particle physics for many, many years, visiting several big labs, uh, Newton Institute, Sacre, et cetera, et cetera. And about six or five or six years ago, uh, he switched to. Many, many particles to many, many neurons. I started getting interested in problems with machine learning, artificial neural networks, uh, magnetic resonance imaging uh, in the brain, and that kind of problem you obviously from the own background, strong mathematical background on these issues of related um, uh, to what I just mentioned. So he will be for three weeks uh, together with all the two visitors that are sitting there and uh, the office near Daniel Martin's office. So um, that also are working on uh, related to the men that also visited for the same group. And for us, it's a big uh, great pleasure to welcome Professor Omar today. And uh, the floor is yours and the title of the talk. So thank you, Omar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation. I'm very happy to give this talk here. And also, um, so I'm a technical physicist. I must say that I, so I'm still working on string theory and stuff like that, but I'm also interested in neural networks and the applications. And also looking at neural networks a bit from the kind of inspired by physics and by holography, which is um, why this problem is for me. But so now I'd like to give you uh, like tell you a story about neural networks and a link with aesthetics. So first I would say that this was by long, it was not a planned research project. I wanted to look for aesthetics in some way, but it came to me as a complete surprise. So I'd like just to show you like what I was doing and then how this connection somehow arises. So the plan of this talk is as follows. So I will give kind of an introduction, gentle introduction to artificial neural networks. And I would like to especially emphasize how the neural networks learn. Then I will also say a few words about the link between a human visual system and neural networks, to what extent has been kind of what types of connections have been made there, and introduce generative neural networks, which will be the main topic of the main part of, of my talk. Then so here I study not representations of a single image, but rather how the network represents whole universe of images. So now it may be confusing, but I hope that after this introduction, it will be very clear to you what this means. And here I will give the main observations of this of this talk. Then I'll give some gallery of examples, nice pictures to look at, and close with some uh, comments and summary. Okay. So what are artificial neural networks? So of course they're inspired. By the brain, right, and by the neurons which live in the brain, right? We have some inputs, the cell body, and output. And what is quite well, what artificial neural networks do, they take an extremely simplified, extremely coarse 
model of how a neuron looks and then try to use it. What is quite surprising, it was also surprising for me, is that this model of a neuron, which is used basically at a neural level, is extremely similar to the model from 1943 by Makarov and Pitts. So something extremely, extremely simple. So the Makarov and Pitts model of this neuron is just that the inputs, xi are the inputs here, which are binary. Then wi is the weight of the connection, b. Then we make the sum, weighted sum of the inputs plus some offset. And then if the answer is negative, it's zero. If the answer is positive, it's one. So it is just an extremely, extremely simplified version of the new one. So the main motivation of them was that it could realize Boolean logic. Now, if we move to 21st century and take the most modern artificial network networks we have to use, the model of a new one is like that. So it's almost the same. We have also a linear combination of the inputs. There are two differences only. One difference is that instead of binary inputs, we have real inputs. And this function is different. So when this is negative, it's still zero. But when the argument is positive, it's not one, but it's just an identity. So, so this is just a linear function when it's positive, it's zero when it's negative. And that's basically it. So the whole power of deep learning and neural networks is just to stack sufficiently many elements of this simple computational um, um, formulas. So typically, we connect many of such, such neurons into many layers with all connections like that. Now, typically, in this artificial neural network context, most of the networks are fit parallel. So basically, there are no loops going there. So there are some recurrent neural networks, but they are quite difficult to use and not very popular. So currently, they are not very really used. So basically, all the neural networks which you encounter and hear about in the news have this type of, of structure. And of course, here there are lots of parameters. So each of those neurons have individual parameters, so those connection weights, W, I, and B. And they have to be learned during training. Now, deep learning is basically just taking many of those layers, 50 to 100 um, layers of neurons, and perhaps some more and more architectures. So the type of network which I will describe here is something like that, which has around 55 million parameters. So it's really, really a lot. So each block like that is really composed of a couple of different layers which are somehow interconnected in a slightly more complicated way. But this is basically the structure of, of such a network. And I will describe it in more detail later. So what do those neural networks do? So the most common case study is just to classify images. So the first application was so-called MNIST dataset, which was uh, some small images of handwritten digits. So I think it was applications in the US Postal Office, right? So that so they did uh, read on you know, handwritten zip papers and so on. So previously it was kind of a difficult problem, but now this is like the most elementary hello world machine learning. So it's different. But of course, there are more complicated situations. So one is so-called cipher 10 data set, which have small 32 pixel by 10 pixel images, which are grouped into 10 classes. You see it's some kind of a very narrow choice of objects which can exist. So of course, here the drawback is that, well, the images are quite small, so you can really have to have difficulty seeing anything there. And secondly, it's a very restricted subset of the natural environment. So people developed the most kind of state-of-the-art uh, data set, which is so-called ImageNet. And I'm describing that because this will be important later. So these are basically 1.2 million images, which are quite high resolution. So 250 by 250 pixels, please. So you really see all the details. And they are uh, put classified into 1,000 different classes. So it's a very rich for dog, various plants, various uh, uh, animals, some pl planes, whatever. So lots of everyday objects, some pizza, incredible amount of various classes. So they give a very kind of balanced view of what we is like in our environment. What is will be important for me later is that it's no out there. 
So there are no, no pictures of painting, paintings, no sketches, no graphics, and so on. So these are just ordinary, straightforward things which you would kind of see when you just walk around and just make certain statues. And that's it. But don't go to the museum. So it's... Okay, so <clears throat> how do neural networks learn? So I told you that everything is encoded in those weights of the strength of the neural neuronal connections. And you have to learn those strengths during this process of learning, training. And the main point, of course, is, is that a neural network is trained by showing examples. So, for example, if you have want to distinguish an Afghan hound, you have to several a thousand pictures like that. And then golden retriever we have several pictures like that. So these are concrete examples from this image that data set which I showed you on the previous slide. And then you show the network many, many times. Then when it makes an error, the weights are appropriately kind of modified in such a way that it would be learned to distinguish those um, uh, those two bits of dots. So here I will um, collectively uh, call all those parameters W, I, and B by the letter theta. So theta will denote does the set of all parameters all the neurons in, in the network. So what's important here is the fact that the network does not really follow any kind of explicit algorithm or definition of a concept. So one could say that really in the network, training in the network is just like building intuition. So it's like we built intuition, we don't know why. And in fact, the main problem in one of the big problems in, in artificial intelligence and machine learning is the network classifies something or performs some choice, and you want to ask why. And the network will not be able to help you that. And also, it will be very difficult to, that by looking at the network, how it does the computation, just to understand how it does it. So it's very much like intuition. So basically, it's not like that computers are something rational and so on. So here we, we train, build something which has intuition. And now people want somehow to put in this rational component so that the network could do reasoning and could do some, something, some self reference to, uh, to some elementary process. So, but basically, this is the big, big issue. Now, <clears throat> the networks which are used for images. In fact, so called convolutional neural networks. So they are built by layers which perform some convolutions with some small filters. So this was motivated by biology by the brain because such convolutions with some filters are used for edge detections. And one knew that V1 detects edges with the representations. But of course, those networks use this type, same type of idea also very far away from the edges. But they just iteratively perform these convolutions and do some nonlinearities and so on. So <clears throat> it's a natural question to ask to what extent these neural networks remain some similarity which is biological motivation. So there were a number of works starting in 2014 where people tried to compare activations from fMRI when people were watching various kinds of photographs and images. And with activations in a convolutional neural network. So, basically, the experiment was that the person was watching some images, had FMI recording, and then one could put the same image to a neural network, which is trained in this image that data set. And then the question was can we predict the voxel activation? And in fact, it turns out that this model is making quite a good job, especially in the higher areas. The higher areas are most difficult to understand because. P1 is those edges, one knows what should come out. But if one goes higher up in the visual hierarchy, it's far more trivial to really understand what was boxes are doing. So, therefore, one could say that this type of structure of convolutions may have still some, something, some similarity to the functional of the real brain. Of course, it's a different time scale, so like all the feedback connections are missing, but one could say that this. Kind of captures the integrated in time process of a large number in time and space of the block of, of boxes of neurons which make a box. So I would say that this ENM here kind of serves intuitively to model visual perception. Because we can see an image and then it kind of models how 
the brain transforms it. Right? So this is what I said, told you. Also, so I discussed so far new networks which are used for image classification. So we have images and we want to classify them in different categories: cat, dog, car, plane, mountain, and so on. So this is like visual perception. But now there's another question, which is like quite obvious and maybe it's not more difficult, difficult, which is to go the other direction. Start this category and make other the new attitude to generate an image of this category. So imagine a dog, imagine a uh, Afghan or whatever, and make the network to construct an image. So these are called generated new networks, and so the main focus of stock and the post -dex. Guns, not of Dali, children mothers, which you know how exactly of this of this type. They are trained also by showing many real images, but here it's important they not it's not they should not memorize, but they should really generate images which are the same type but different from what they train. So they somehow what they learn is they learn the commonalities of, of the data. So one could think of them. As modeling kind of visual imagination, right? Because we imagine a dog, we think the dog in picture of a dog comes comes somewhere. Yes, you can you repeat again what you think? How are you going to generate the images? From where are you going to start? Can you start from data from the fMRI? No, no, no. I, I will not mention fMRI at all. This was just an introduction that people use use okay. use make this connection. Can you repeat then what are the steps uh, that they're going to end up in the images? Uh, just to summarize here, summarize like this. Yeah. Yes. So you're going to start from where? So, so this selection of images, the my experiment is that the person looks at those images and the voxels are recorded. And then the question is, can we predict, depending on the image, what will be the active, what will be the activations of those voxels? So what, what those people do did, they took a neural letter which was trained for classification on ImageNet. They showed it the same image as they showed the, to the human. And then, as this network, as this image was passing to the network, those various internal layers had different kind of activations inside. So then they fitted the voxel with some function of some activations. And so then they each had fitting yes. from the fMRI from the, from the neural network to the fMRI. No, no, but you don't modify the network. You're just looking at the network. Yeah, just you look at it. Sense the images and you just sense the images in a similar way. Yes, but of, but of course, there's some kind of really function from set of We are check, we, we adjust the way it's network depending on whether you can model the. No, no, no. Oh, okay. So no, the, the way it's here fixed, but the passage from the activations to the voxel yeah. is something which has to be fitted. Have to be what fitted. So the okay. so it's really hard without touching the head. Without touching the head. Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, it's because I mean, you draw the net of the image. And yes. Each each layer has a certain part of the image. Yes. Yes. So so after some some layers. Yeah. For example, I have like twenty three times twenty five times twenty times times hundred fifty six times. Because there are many, many channels. And then this is this is really good, a linear function would get not to the voxel. Because, because of course, also each voxel is sensitive to different aspects of the image. Mm -hmm. So, therefore, from this, you have different linear functions depending on how you move in that way, for example. And in this way, one can kind of model and then try to understand how to understand this number. Right. Okay, so uh, so here I use this generated neural network, which is trained on the ImageNet, well, which just encodes all this information about this visual world in its connection. So it's called 55 million parameters. So what we say to strike 55 million parameters and then necessarily to imagine those weird objects. And of course, it's virtually impossible to understand how this encoding is made. 
So somehow I will present to you is some way of trying to understand or at least to, to investigate how those images are encoded in those parameters in some way. So let me first give more details about the network. So this network has two inputs. One is the class of an image which you want to produce, stupa. And then second input is some kind of noise because you don't want to just produce a single stupa, you want to have a whole variety. And this whole variety will depend on this noise, which will also be Buddhist. 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 Ah. So it's, let me see. Oh, it's, this is ah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is generated by this net, by complete, with a complete choice. Now, if you. Wait, wait, wait. Isn't it a real network? Yes. Yes. It's not a real No, no, no. So somehow all the information kind of is contained on the inside. Now, if we change the noise, we change super, we get, for example, a different example. Again, by, made by the network. Yeah. If we have an espresso, well, we have also espresso, but now you see that it's very nice. But for example, if you look here, you see that somehow the network does not talk that you can just take an espresso cup. And when you put espresso and instead of noise, you put a input the image of the super. Well, I can't because it's just it's a vector. It's a just a vector. It's not like this noise. It does not have a structure of an image. It just hundred twenty eight right. numbers, which I which I just uh, put in. So you see that there are some kind of anomalies here. This is another espresso. Here's the two three shots. So three shots is quite easy. So there's basically no no problems with that. And here's another three shot image. So at least what you see here is that. It's quite incredible, but these are kind of absolutely conventional photorealistic images, which are generated. But you see that basically, if we have such a network with some given set of parameters, whatever it is, you can just put the numbers and some images will come out. So now, the, the thought what we have is basically a mapping from a set of parameters of the network to some visual universe of images, right? All the images that can be generated from a network with these parameters. Now, if we take those, um, if we take these parameters to be the trained ones, which were trained by those people, then we generate photorealistic images. So now the question is, how does this space of images change when we modify the parameters? So we are here, this is where the image is. So now we want somehow to move into the space of parameters and try to understand in what way the space of generated images will get modified. So basically, again, the same story. Here, we are sitting at the point which was trained by those people on the image deck, and now we want to move in various directions. And of course, here we have to remember that so we are moving in a 55 million dimensional space parameters. So it's kind of mind boggling really large. And all of our intuition is coming from like this two dimensional picture are gone, because basically any two directions, random directions are completely orthogonal, right? It's very difficult to find something. By sampling, unless it's something generic. So, there are kind of very much combinatorial issues here. Okay, so <clears throat> the first part we want to make like what would be the most natural modification of those parameters. So, we have this network. So, basically, we'd like to randomly increase the strength of some parameters, randomly increase the strength of others. And it's sensible to go to do it in a multiplicative way. So therefore we just change the percentage of, of those weights. So basically we take the original weights, multiply them by a random number around one, the normal distribution is mean one, and get the new new weights, and then we have new networks, and then we can just fit the same data and look what comes out. And this is what, what comes kind of comes out. So here, each each column is the output of a, of a different neural network. So here, this column here is the original one, the trained one, which I told you before, because uh, that's an image which you recognize. While here, goes one one perturbation, here's another perturbation, another, 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 another. So, and it's quite kind of strange. So, so first of all, what one sees is that to get something photorealistic, you really have to have lots of fine tuning, you can imagine, because it's sharp edges, everything has to fit. 
the input is the same? Yes, yes. So the input is exactly it's okay. uh, exactly. And when I see that the images are very similar, yes. Yes, yes, yes. So here it's exactly the same input to each of those. Yeah. Yeah. So the color change comes from the multiplication of those of those weights. So this so we see in fact that this uh, uh, change is due to um, so we use this photorealistic issue, but what is quite this was amazing and completely surprising for me, so I did not expect it all was that uh, like this looks like some kind of simplifications like done in sketchings or in paintings, right? Also, you can see here that it's not kind of chaotic, psychedelic kind of modifications, but you have kind of smooth gradients, like the colors also have very, very nice natural uh, transitions and so on. So <clears throat> we have something which looks kind of like painting or sketch, even so the originality was not really show it. So all the effect comes from kind of modifying these weights in, in the scenario. So what this tells us, what, uh, what are the conclusions from that? So first of all, to show that some kind of thing like some, some kind of aesthetic properties may really come from, from this neural parameterization of this environment, the visual environment, okay? right? Without any, any really contact with human made out. So in a way, so here I would say that what is this network the impact in, the input of culture was zero, right? There's no culture. One could say that this network is kind of like biology because. So this ties in with this hypothesis of new aesthetics. The aesthetic perception may be linked to properties of the human visual system. So like Zeki and Machandra ago proposed this kind of point of view. And what they argued, at least in a very qualitative level was that uh, the depiction of the essence of a concept is really is considered a system in the sense that some so if we have some neurons which fire when it's like a cup but if we get an image which really makes them fire much more than when you see an ordinary cup from ordinary cup then perhaps it's maybe that we capture the essence of this cup in some way so um here you can understand that these random perturbations really average out the inessential photorealistic particularities, which example. So somehow we move closer to this essence in some way. But on the other hand, here this happens in some way which is compatible with our visual perception. So somehow it really looks like nice and so, so it's not just like blurring, Gaussian blurring of, of an image. It's something more. And it's something more must be captured by synthetic. So <clears throat> this is kind of one experiment which which um, I want to present. Now the second experiment is something which could be interpreted as kind of visual. Yes, in the previous figure we have the examples. Yes, um, immediately there is some idea that we can. Quantify what is preserved for the correlation space or the idiomatic space in the images. I mean, it seems that correlations are reserved to gross to the beginning. But this is a general property that we in order to break correlations, you have to then really the perturbation. There is some kind of scaling between the perturbation that you make in the space, the 55 million around the space, and the and the scale of the correlation really. Okay. I guess it must be so. so for example, here, like the fact that we use photorealism, we use details, means that like correlations in typical violet are kind of worked out somehow in this in the more like, into small, smaller, smaller, the big kind the big picture. The big are preserved in some way. But but this will this will in fact depend on what kind of perturbations we do. So in fact, in the next you know, in the next example, I will show something which is it's the, the different features. And the question is so if you take ambiguous figures, so if you take uh, what is called ambiguous figures with the perception switch between two states, mm -hmm. there are several examples, yes. and you use that as your image, as you start an image, instead of a cup of coffee, you start with this classical ambiguous figure with the perception switch in two, and you perturb 
you get switch also. So here I cannot do that because well here this network it generates all those figures. So I cannot input an image. And also in the way that this network was trained, it can also only generate one of those 1000 classes that were appeared in the training. Why not if then we generate a cup of coffee? Why can't I put in the input class knowledge and then we do that? No, because the, the, the input is just a cup of coffee, and the noise is just a vector of yeah. real numbers. But it's, it's it, well, it does, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe you don't have a name for it. No, but the, the, what I'm talking about is a typical image of, a, of an old lady and a, and a rabbit. Yes, it's a little. Yeah, but I can't get the network image. You don't have an image. They yes. Put the text of what the image should be. It's a label. It's a label. It's a label and sound. Some noise work of yes. 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 yes, and also the noise is just like some. I understand. Yes, so unfortunately, you have you look at this? Just, just a quick Have you look at it and the how, how the transitions between because I have each each network is a, a big vector in yes, T, yes. T, yes. T, yes. yes, 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 Let's say the realistic level yes. has one vector and then you can turn back to the chair. I could go linearly from yes. here yes. to here, see how this cuts before. Yes. 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 yes, 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 yes. So people can see, but I will, I will, I will show you an example of that later when there will be a bigger check <laughs> change. So, <clears throat> so now we can try to look for a different way of deviating, modifying those weights of the network. So previously we randomly compute all weights in some not so drastic way. But now we can do something else. We want to localize the deformed exchange. We, we focus on some small part of the network, but change it completely. And we want, so here the example is that we want to upset just some deep semantic part because semantic, because here we have what we want to copy, for example, or block or whatever. So therefore we want to change something here and to leave the rest unmodified. So we just will replace the parameters in this block with completely random numbers, which are just samples from a normal distribution with the color mean and virus. And again, see what, what comes out. And here is what comes out. So it's again the same kind of picture. So it's the only ones that start from figures which would appear when they are unmodified. Uh, when the B2 B is replaced by random connections. <coughs> so first, in fact, when I saw like the first set and so on for each single network, they can seem completely hazardous and random. Right. But now if you look at them like together, you see lots of similarities. For example, here you see that this espresso cup has the distinctive circular structure. And somehow this is preserved, but it's kind of built up into different textures and different, different ingredients. Here we have a volcano, it's, just, it's triangular, it's again somehow encoded so deeply in the whole network that it's preserved, but then it's filled out with different stuff. For the stupa, it's more subtle, so we have some kind of quasi architectural stuff here, but here we, here we also have presses, like this. It's, it's, kind of, it's here, it looks like a head, and somehow it's the network, the whole network gets to generate some strange looking passes. So basically, what you see that somehow a dominant visual feature of original object is realized in non standard ingredients. You can say that this is just symbolic representation, right? But visual symbolic representation, not, not me, not dealing with content, but just with, with uh, uh, visual features. Size. So here, of course, one can make an extremely qualitative thing that there may be something of those like psychoanalysis in different dreams, like in the sense that we have chalks objects representing various higher level phenomena. But of course, this is completely kind of in a way extremely far from that because this gives only with some very distinctive, strong visual features. And of course, for this, you, for this to be seen, you have to have also a class which has struggled. For example, strawberries, you have some lots of texture, red textures appearing, but some more fancy classes, it will be like a telephone, dial telephone, 
you have very difficult time to recognize what the network thought was essential in some way. In some way. So this can be seen, especially in such something which is extremely kind of distinctive. And then you can really see some source of how some visual symbolic representation may arise. Now, so this was scrambling the second block. Now, if we scramble some higher blocks, only the second block. Yes, only the second block. So all the rest was shouldn't be the other way around because the the, the first blocks they they represent the, the fundamental purposes of some of some source, right? So shouldn't the if you want to have the symbolic meaning of certain things, you should scramble everything besides something everything. Well, but somehow it it helps this way. No, no, no. Uh, I, uh, so, so it seems that the second block somehow represents more like that, like the coffee cup we made from like the glass of China, right? So the texture, yeah, the texture of something that would be like uh, something more, more of a different. Different nature, not that this overall shape, mm -hmm. but there's some sense in dealing with the ingredients. Yes, right. because here it seems that the ingredients are complicated, mm -hmm. while the, some form, the overall form seems to be kind of more globally mm -hmm. represented. Have you, what, what happens if you change the menu? You do it to yes, so some yes, so this will be yes. okay. this example. So sometimes, we, so first of all, we get something which is. Almost abstract and it's very difficult to recognize, but then we move to something which is you see that it's something like a deformation of, of the original object. So, the most interesting from the point of view, from, point of, from my point of view, are those initial kind of layers. Because later, the end of the last ones are boring because they really construct the pixel perfect photorealism. So, you modify them and then they give some. Some deficiencies, some colors, some nothing really interesting. So, what's really interesting is this initial state which generates, builds up this image. So, for example, we get this type of image and this type of image. And in fact, both of them came from the tropical. But now it's really difficult to understand in what way, what happened. So, how did this device? And in fact, this is exactly the story that we put something in the group. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So now we'd like to move from. So here we have this network, the photorealistic one. Here we have the default one, and here is the default one. And now we can move slowly, change slowly the network parameters along this line, and see how the generated copy will uh, will look like. So we just go along the line, and this is the first example. That's the kind of function which. So you see that initially it's more like again like a drawing with some nice kind of pastel colors, but then somewhere around here you kind of lose the meaning of coffee completely. And now for the final letter, the, it imagines coffee as this concept. Right? So also it's nice because you see that kind of the concept concepts are completely changed. So you have to witness here kind of alien worlds with some work, internal worlds of those metrics. So it's nice for imagination. So, <clears throat> and here basically something similar happens also at, at some certain distance. You see this complete transition where people lose our uh, lose the feature that we used to recognize. He is six, so, but he is already already kind of absent. And another feature which is kind of extremely striking for me when uh, when I was looking at those images is that those deformations really. Those images have some organic, organic feel, right? They, they're not something which is kind of harsh, strange, but you do something like you would take your finger in, in some time. So, so, yeah, so it's it's something very organic. Yes, 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 So it's it's a feature of this. Okay, so now I will show you the gallery of examples. So, of course, here, apart from this, like, sort of science, of course, I was also interested in it in just like looking time to generate various images. So, I made some exhibition, for example, of those images. 
Goed, dus ook hier. Um, so this website and Instagram I was posting various uh, images. So now I'm sorry to say those are features. No. <laughs> no. So uh, so I'm showing you some various head fixed images of kind of those two types and also from some funny variations of those of the signal. <clears throat> so here, for example, as I'm again it's two pass, which is more like a like a pass than what I want to call it. Since it's a kind of more conventional and darker, like all the images. Here, doing it in a different way, you can get like very, very strong variations in color. And this type of objects, which are kind of quite, quite uh, closely delineated, but with differences, complete differences in structure and also in what is natural color of the copy as well. You can, so, it's a telephone. No, it's a telephone, dial telephone. So here's the hand loop, here's the ring ring. So all the all the is Yes. So did you find it yourself or is it made by this it looks like it was Picasso by just uh, yes. yes, you, you found it just by yes, yeah. so I want so clear. Yeah, yeah. I mean the recent thing I seen learning that will even allow you to predict uh, which piece of art is belong to in the history of art. No, yeah, it but should be. It should be. I don't know. I know. I don't know. But you say okay, they change the this way. Yeah. The material is classified as a bigger yeah. 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 There are some that you can like say, I want a copy drawn in Picasso style. That is one of them. I think you mentioned it at the beginning of the course. And then I think some examples. But also quite like have it nice to kind of put in random numbers and then see what comes out. Mm -hmm. Never know if it will be something of it uh, stupid or something really mm -hmm. uh, interesting. So here are some kind of more of like landscape like images. But also something like that. So it's uh, exactly as examples of the visual symbolic documentation. So it's about paint on a Buddhist stupa. So now this is completely kind of surrealistic, like surrealism, right? Dream, dream it, like, like, <laughs> mm -hmm. it's, yeah, I was completely amazed when I saw this coming out from, from the nerves. Mm -hmm. Now, it's <clears throat> more like, like oh, a bit more advanced, like, and then here, we can also make some more like graphic poster like stuff, if one changes some other parts of the world. Also, some so it's like home site and uh, and also we can move in, or again changing the way that we that I modified this part of that we can get something more completely more abstract which are not represented in so recognizable and like like that like that for example and what are you varying to get these different images? Like it's the noise parameter, but it's the noise parameter in the whole network or just in specific levels? So, so the noise parameters is the input. So basically here, for example, for those, for those, uh, those two stupas, in fact, the noise parameter is exactly the same. And it's the same as the original stupa. I never changed the You have something clear that gives a sense of the variation and that is due to changing the last one. I don't say so I don't know. Coffee cups uh, the same, yeah, third pick up a different inputs. Yeah, I look at it, but I don't have it. I don't have it here. But there's, there's, there's some, 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 some variation, but also that's not similar. It's not similar. So here, what, what changes is the uh, perturbation of the weights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she and she. So here I modify the perturbation of the weights, and sometimes I also change which part of the network is modified. Whether it's completely erased and changed by random, I can do it in different blocks. So here I also change it. But you could test how the images change in as a function of, I don't know, like, sorry, I, I have to think my question. Like you can vary the noise parameter only for a specific level of the network. And see what happens if you vary that noise parameter for the first level to the second level to the third level. Yeah, so for example, this is comes from the second block. So here I only replace the second block by complete noise, by completely random numbers. While here I think it's some other phase block or 
so so uh, so these images come from modifying different parts and then there is a sense that the first layer deal with local features and the last layer more, more global because uh, here, here is opposite the, 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 so because it, because these are generated so decomposition yes yes so so anyway yes so the last last couple of blocks are completely uninteresting because they only change some local features in not an interesting way but the first ones have quite dis distinctive feature and they are kind of more global changes also it's nice because here we can see that like also in the new analytics the different even so the blocks look similar very similar they have different functions so they represent different if, if you modify the first block could you have another object because it's the one that encodes the object to an image imagine you could a cup of coffee but you have noise in the first layer yes so maybe you end up with another object yes so, so the so the very first the one which encode changes from the copy or whatever from the classes to something else so i didn't change it i did not change it the first block i get complete garbage which i cannot be <laughs> okay so somehow the interesting things happen so it seems that the first block is really something which is fundamental for the rest the second block right which gives this type of stuff is already kind of interesting but it's local, locally photorealistic, but then globally it's, it's strange. Then later, kind of you, look, you lose this locally photorealistic effect and you have this, the, the, the ones which I showed the transitions. And then you move on to something which is definitely a recognizable deformation of, of the cup. So you could track in which level of the neural network uh, it's a specific thing change, like for example, I don't know, in the fourth layer, uh, it changed the shape, or in the fifth level, I, it changed the color, or it's not so. It's not so. So unfortunately, it's not so simple. In the sense that I can see some qualitative um, features in what what I would expect, it but changed. nothing to change, but more like global, right? So here is something kind of photorealistically local. Here I have something. Else, but I cannot pinpoint a complete stuff. The, the concept cells are right yeah. in the brain. We have brain that is cells, neurons, yes, that are uh, as intelligent physical stuff called concept cells. That's what we mean. He yeah. named the gorgons in the brain of humans, and he discovered that some neurons in the temporal lobe are able to identify an activist. Yeah. These are the so after he he made a he he would end up end up um suggesting that this area of the brain has taken so many features to be able to recognize the difference done by you name the brain or seeing the name written this way or the image or the movie or whatever. Could it be that you can Make an experiment perturbing to identify where in the in the hierarchy of the, the network the concept is really preserved for this experiment. Because you mentioned that you want to make a transition back to the real range. So, so here I don't is related to what Trini was asking, where yes. in the layer something yes. the, that we can assign a meaning. Yes. Here it's not, um, not just, mm, I, I guess that here some it seems that um, part of the encoding what is a coffee cup is kind of smeared almost throughout because like um, for example but it's So various aspects of this coffee cup list are present in, in those various parts of the network. Like uh, when we changed the second block, kind of we lost this the China, the material which was made, but we had preserved nevertheless the rounded shapes. Later, um, so 
but it's not really the first block in nature. The first block is just this. So the concept is up here in the second here, right? Yes. But but I have to I, I have to preserve the first block. Because if I scramble it, I will get complete garbage, which I cannot recognize at all in any way. So somehow it seems that it's very important for, for representing it. But it's not enough because if I change those blobs here, I still get something which is far away from, from the copy card. So um, perhaps for me, the conclusion is that somehow the coding for what is a copy card is very much distributed, but it's, it's of course not uniform because each of those blocks have different function. But nevertheless, I cannot really pinpoint where it is, which is, but maybe also true for I don't. Okay, so some comments. So first about genders. So those two first examples about the multiplicative perturbations and symbolic representations, at least they seem to be very generic. So if you change the random seeds, you will get you, you can see most cases this type of behavior really like features or like land shapes which are different ingredients. The examples in those last slides were very handy picked. So we have to look many for many cases, and then you can see some striking examples like this surrealistic like like floating uh, uh, symbol or whatever. But here, so I can say that the distribution of the talent among humans is also not uniform. If I draw something, it will be very far from a Picasso. Mm -hmm. right? So, also, what I can say that yes, some networks are more talented than others. Right? Very or, very 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 to, in order to, to choose some artistic example that the guy did, you have to throw away yeah. most of your artistic production. Yes, yes, I see. Yes, you want to make money. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. But, <laughs> However, oh, here, at least for me, it's really remarkable that even these things exist, right? Because in the fact, because it's something in this 55 million universe, at least an extent of it, or the actual problem of examples. It's difficult because it's difficult to play with examples like this, because I have to look at them. They're going to open a website and say, classify, you know, for the use of the Yeah. I'd like to put it to you there. The reverse of it is it's not that this is remarkable, but rather that art is not remarkable. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, That's it's, it's just people with fucked up for Yeah. Yes, but it's not in fair of a secret. Yes. <laughs> but I didn't want to say that. <laughs> okay. But anyway, so here also in this context, it's a good, very good place to. Inside of us, right? It's a library of other story, right? Where people were going to a library, which books which are kind of randomly or possible books which could be written by uh, and of course most of them were complete garbage, right? But it was said that this is a book with your life written there. But of course, if you think about it, complete random choices of letters will never give even a single sensible partner, right? You would have to and wait for the end of the universe to. Randomly generated. So the fact that here we nevertheless see by random sampling something which is that means that there's a very strong prior information which is which is present in there. So it's not uniform random sampling of pixels, but you have to build in something inside which is somehow this artificial level based on the visual environment has some kind of underlying structure, captures some underlying structure, aesthetics, or artistic perception by humans in some way. So this natural web coupled together with its, with its coding and its awareness of the matter is somehow put in. Now, a second point is that one could say that what we did here was something like people in neuroscience did or studied, because in neuroscience process classical source of knowledge is some famous patient, patients, HM, gauge, right? We had some legends at the very And then people started what as a um, Cognitive consequences. So what we did here, especially in the second part, which is a localized random scrambling, is we introduced some artificial levels into the neural network, and then looked at like the corresponding output and tried to understand what was the function of those localized parts of the network. So this may be 
because like if one has this network which has 55 million parameters, some language model which has 9 billion parameters, it's extremely virtually impossible to even if you know if you have a pie with all the values of all the weights, it doesn't help you at all because you don't know what is the meaning of those weights. Right. So we start to face a problem which is similar to how we started the brain to study, understand how this knowledge is represented in the connection sense of this big neural network. So then now it's time to study it with large language models, do some kind of relations there and try to see what changes when, when the knowledge about the geographical names, for example, they call it it's this type of. of, of, of and the final comment, my comment is randomness, because here a crucial element of all cognitive constructions was the introduction of some kinds of randomness. And now, if we want to think about what kind of state of the brain has increased randomness, then it's, it's like secondary status. No? It has been measured that indeed this neural diversity of signals is, is larger. So, of course, this can also be some interpretations maybe made in this direction. Okay, so now to summarize. So basically, the point was that this particular network represents a whole space of images. And here we, we looked how it changes when we move away. And it seems that this amortization of the space of images is extremely rich and kind of has surprising features, which were extremely, extremely, extremely surprising. So we have this type of artistic rendition, and which seems to arise that there's lots of like biology involved. So here this, as I said, it's no culture, but it's basically some abstract model of a visual system. So visual imagination in some way, which is kind of enough, and it can generate sometimes some quite images which, which are quite similar to what an artist produced, some styles which would look at. Um, okay, so we also saw on the visual work of presentations and one can say that it's going to have the computational time model for looking at some objects like aesthetics or symbolic pictures. And I can also the model of this. Questions, comments, critiques, ideas, money, donations. <laughs> <laughs> T-shirts, yeah. Um, I have just one question because uh, these DALI models, right, they they uh, take two modalities already, right? You have text and you have image. So in that sense, in this sense, could you could also change, I guess, because this is pre-language somehow. Yes, it will. So I guess you could also do the same kind of Things in the post language, changing the you know, embedding of the, of the words that you're using to describe the object. So, have you looked into that? Yet? No, 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 no. At some stage, I wanted to. Because you know. you're looking at language models with uh, micro, right? Yes, yes. But it's a purely, pure, purely generated language models. So, I thought, unfortunately, DALI is we cannot take the weights. DALI? Yeah. Well, because it's close. There are some versions which are uh, so such, some versions which will be. Like a public domain, mm -hmm. but it kind of generates not so nice images, much worse policy than, than that. But I, yeah, I didn't try doing that. I definitely wanted to, at some stage, where I tried to carry out the example, I did. then try to, to do that. You mentioned in your conclusion that uh, there was a comment also that it was surprising that something came up. Already 55 million parameters. Uh, my, my, my comment is, but, but there is an image that built a sort of a exclusion of many, many, many more millions of parameters, meaning that there is a pre trained uh, parameter space in which you want to start playing. Yes, yes, right. yes. So, Meaning that you are you are you are playing with something that is already a, a constrained by by this by the language by the sorry by the image. Yes, yes. So in in this this comic has to do with how aesthetic or how art yes. have come out. Yes. 
and it's this huge parameter space where it's kind of steady. Yes. What is the chance that by chance you mention yes. that um, yes. monkey type writer or yes. the coordination yes. that produce a text? Yes. But somehow, do you understand what is my concern that there probably is an over interpretation? Yeah. Because of it. You may say? Well, no, I, I would say that. Uh, so, so when I I agree with that comment. Yes. Yes. The, 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 the neural parameterization without any contact, you will get some steady problem. In sense, the same sense of the consonants and dissonance, you don't need a niche kind of education. Yes. Yeah, yes. I would say that I definitely agree with you because uh, what I want to do analysis here because this training of an image left is crucial because this is our visual environment. Yes. And the weights were just one well, say this. Network is like human who observes the end. So therefore, like the fact that this like artistic life or aesthetic life arises later is a property which is kind of derived from this how our environment looks like. The correlation, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. So so I would say that uh, um that um, it is aesthetics really involves in a crucial way the natural world, what we see. Yeah, the, exactly. So, this is the yeah. pattern. And then I move. Mean, it's an property for the, for the dynamic of the images that you see. Yes. And then, as I move away, it's quite recognizable that I think something which is similar to art, right? In, the, in some way. But also, like the edges of nice, and everything seems to be. Flowing or organic in, in, in some in some way, and this property definitely is because some part of the network still has unchanged weights from ImageNet or modified only in a small way. Because if you would start from this new network with random parameters, you would get completely garbage and also uninteresting garbage with not much structure. So somehow, sometimes I was trying to play, trying to crank up. From looking at the statistics, like power of statistics of images, but what we get something uh, interesting. But the network was just producing various blobs of various two colors, which had different proportions and shapes, such that statistics was, were very much power like, but it was not enough. So, therefore, uh, it's really crucial that this thing on image net on this whole rich. Visual structure occurs because it gives some very strong time for moving into this. This is really much a paper that is going to be later 10 years ago. The title was very interesting. <laughs> the, the, the title was the Thermodynamic of Natural Images. He went to the Central Park, I was there in the Pell University, so I was a visiting professor, and he took pictures in the Central Park. There was obviously most of that was trees and natural. Yes, scared and then something in the yes. and came back to the lab and he started playing pictures and rights and pixels and computed stuff and did yes. a power line, power yes. distribution, and then blah blah blah. And he built an icing model of, 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 the, of the structure. And, and this paper was, um, was sort of his. It's entered, she has sent it to analyzing the statistics of the retina, so how the retina is able to capture natural images and how we evolve to, to evolution to, to take advantage of the statistics and the correlations and so on. Okay. Close parenthesis. Have you, thinking of this paper, which is a classic, have you been tempted to analyze your images to see? Under which conditions natural images, not coffee, yes. a cup of inches, are preserved or not? Means computing similar quantities. So I was I was trying. So what I tried to do was because from, from that one I said our spectrum, our spectrum of Fourier coefficients, yeah. which was keep doing that. I don't get it. And. Uh, so what I, I tried to do, I tried to take this network, but untrained, and then train it, requiring that 
the output will have this power law spectrum. Because I hope that in this way one can have some interesting structure appear. And you say that we're looking at reducing constraint product. Well, here I don't, um, I think it's so, so, no, so here the input will just get random noise and generate it with image. And I want to ensure that the image will have this power law spectrum. Ah, okay, you force an error to generate this infinite number. Yes, yeah, with, with power law spectrum. Because, so I was hoping that one could get some rich structure, but it was not. So the generated images indeed have power law spectrum, but they had like two, two colored blocks. Which will look like, like the minimal way to, to ensure this power of spectrum. So, so therefore, somehow this richness of the big one world has to be much more, much more involved. In the sense that this power law, the power of spectrum was. Um, I think the question was that instead of the other, not that. So I don't yeah, think the question is if you don't impose the power law, but yes, with, with your. For third network, you produce natural images. Do these natural images before natural images have the same statistical properties as actual? Yes. Yeah. So, so I, don't, I don't know. I don't yeah, know. because you mentioned that uh, there are several consequences of all of that on this. And you mentioned psychedelic, psychedelic, uh, uh, psychedelic drugs, affect perception, and so on. For instance, there is uh, self portraits in LSD. Mm -hmm. Uh, consumption with the famous paintings, ten minutes, twenty minutes, and so on. I you see, you haven't seen that. No, no, I tell you, you can't do it. And, uh, and so there is a, a need to, and obviously, you have to come from physics if you to develop metrics of what is we call aesthetic and what is the other thing I call aesthetic and so on. So you would agree that these networks and in general. Deep learning uh, methods have uh, the property or the abilities to capture correlations as the only mathematical thing that this, this network are able to do in one way or the other. If that is the case, what correlations are preserved, what correlations are not preserved, and if the scaling problem is preserved. Yes, yes. But but I guess that what is crucial in this network is structure is that. There are lots of nonlinear disorder along the way. So there is definitely very much nonlinear nonlinear correlations, extremely nonlinear correlations and what to point and so on. So like like the correlations which are needed, for example, to make perspective like and something, some building in front of that. Are something which is stimulated. For example, it's no physicist, I guess, would quantify, could be able to quantify it by a formula. So it's but kind of implicit by a formula, by a simple formula. Like the concrete correlations, which are necessary, to make a picture of a building, like we call it perspectives, for example, and things like that. No, no, let, let's so, say you have, yeah. you have your, uh, your trading image, so you have building some photographs, so there's a mm -hmm. and more things. Then you have some well known creative artist make his own. Picture mm -hmm. for each of these images, and then you turn to networks one with one of the actual photographs and one with the artist's yes. photographs. Then you, you probably the, the, when you generate pictures with the artist training network, you, you produce pictures similar to the artist's style. Yes. Yes. And then you could just build up two big vectors and you calculate the same vectors. Mm -hmm. And that, that might conduct to some sort of metric. The metric would be what is. What is the distance between these two neural networks? I mean, the neural network, the kind of uh, the literal neural network that uh, mm -hmm. uh, produces images of its system or the artist neural network. Yes. Perhaps you know. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's also, indeed, in, in connection with that, this, so the, uh, several years ago, there was something which is called never type transfer. When you put a photo in the neural network, a picture of Van Gogh, and then the analytic transformed your photo in the style of, of Van Gogh. Right? So there's some mm -hmm. examples. Yeah, I so think it's... Dali is capable of that too. Yeah, yeah. Like you ask Dali for a specific style and you know, yes. give her a picture. Yes. But in those, in those in your style, there's a specific measure of the similarity of style 
irrespective of content. So basically, it was as a taking so taking this classification letter, looking at some activations, and then looking at the correlation between these activations irrespective of places, for instance, something like that. So that so there are ways of, of trying to complete the fix. Um, in fact, I was trying once when I was involved in some project in Poland dealing with R and EG with uh, some people. And uh, they wanted to kind of generate images which were close to this particular artist. So I tried to use that, that definition to take those images produced from here and pick the letter which is most clo closest in the site as measured by the new site class. So, so that was exactly mm -hmm. using as a neural networks to, to measure, measure distances. Well, uh, I think that you have uh, an appointment to investigate uh, your brain. Yes. <laughs> so whoever wants to go to this, the same thing, this is a good chance, right? I'm very happy to be speaking. Uh, because he's going to be volunteering to spend his brain. Um, you're not going to see any pictures. <laughs> uh, so they, they want to. to they want to follow him and um, <laughs> the studies about Simon. <laughs> <laughs> we thank you.